And then I will say, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to your Liberty Radio. Today is Sunday, August 11th in the year of our clownishness, 2024. Uh, Technically an off day for Liberty Radio, but uh, whenever we can get a guest like this into the studio, uh, that means it's time to knuckle down and uh, put the nose back against the grindstone, no matter how much it may sting. Uh, that's, uh, that's just part of what we do, uh, one of the many services that we provide here at Liberty Radio. Last minute notice, not, I'm just kidding, it wasn't last minute. We set this up like a week ago. Uh, but joining me in the studio today, an old friend of mine, and hopefully by the end of this, he will be a new friend of yours. My buddy Nick from the Hayes Reviews channel on YouTube, on Rumble, on Instagram, on Twitter. Where, where the hell else are you, Nick? You're all over the place, kind of like we are. I got myself up and running on Odyssey as well. Oh, sweet. I'll have to add that to the links when I publish the replay. We got to start pushing Odyssey because they just um, released uh, an update saying there's going to be no more advertisements on the platform, I believe. Absolutely. I agree with you 100% on that. I mean, I've been pushing Odyssey since the day we first started broadcasting because out of everything out there, it is my favorite platform. It gives you the most uh, uh, options. It's the most versatile. Uh, It actually helps the independent media producer more than it punishes them which is not the same thing that I can say about every other platform out there. So when it comes to giving Odyssey love, we are all about that here at Liberty Radio. Excellent. Yeah, it's uh, it's tricky to get people to change. They get really comfortable and they sort of uh, get attached to their platforms like a, a nice, comfy old pair of slippers and they don't want to throw them out and get some new ones, you know, but uh, I think it's worth pushing people and reminding people and encouraging people and uh, giving them a, a view of the benefits and how it helps people like us who are trying to do what we do. Absolutely. Um, so for folks that are not familiar with you, your work, and uh, the fantastic things that you publish to the interwebs, why don't we take the first couple minutes and just get everybody a little bit more familiar with that? Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you very much for uh, having me on this evening. I appreciate it very much. It's definitely been too long since we spoke, uh, but I'm uh, very happy to be here. So yeah, I'm, my name is Nick and I've been uh, up and running with the Hayes Reviews channel now for, um, I want to say I started doing it at the beginning of the year, really. So not too long. Uh, and what I've decided to focus on was books and book reviews. And to give you a little bit of the background as to how I ended up wanting to do that. I was going about my life totally oblivious and unaware as happy uh, until we all got locked down. And for reasons that made no sense and I couldn't uh, understand, that carried on and on and on. (laughs) And throughout this whole event, which I tend to refer to as the Big C event or the Great Scam of 2020, or you know, I quite like Nigel Watson's phrase, the people's pantomime, multiple ways to talk about it. Yeah. I think you know what we're talking about by now, but yeah, we all got locked down and things weren't making any sense. And I went on a little hunt to find out some answers because the mainstream news was not giving me anything other than uh, a sort of anxiety, crippling anxiety (laughs) about going outside and shaking hands and uh, visiting my grandmother and, uh, you know, touching door handles and all these other things. So through that um, seeking of good explanations of events, I found people such as James Corbett and The Last American Vagabond. Um, I discovered a guy called Spiros Skouras. I haven't seen him for a while, but back, yeah, back he's then been he quiet was... quiet for a little bit. Yeah, but he was doing some great interviews. Uh, and then there was the, the uh, epic, uh, I think, four-part or five-part series on London Real interviewing David Icke. <laughs> uh, and they were they were coming out every few weeks or something, long four hour conversations and David doing his thing and giving you lots of breadcrumbs to sort of uh, follow up on. And um, and eventually I, f- I wound my way to an episode of Grand Theft World. And I think it was Grand Theft World episode four, if I remember correctly. And James Corbett was on. 
and James and Richard had a long conversation in which they basically just geeked out over books. And they were saying, hey, have you read this one? Hey, but what about this one? Yeah, yeah, I've read that. What about this? You know, it was just a, a whole hour. And I'm think I was listening to this and I thought, wow, it's so amazing to me. The the topics that they're talking about are actually in books. I can't believe it. And these are things that as I was learning, I couldn't believe I'd never heard of them before. All sorts of different things, you know, like Operation Gladio, um, a lot of the intelligence uh, um serve cia fbi the kind of shady things they get up to and then these inter international bodies you start learning about unesco and un and and who where do these all come from what's the history behind them there's books explaining all this stuff and uh, richard grove's got a lot of them and i thought all right okay so there's a lot of censorship happening and there's a bunch of books out there that explain the history behind what's going on i better start buying some of these because one day with the way things were going, I didn't know how scrubbed the internet was going to be of people who could talk openly and honestly about the reality of these events and, and the history leading up to them. So I just started hoovering up these books, basically, and just grabbing them. And surprisingly, a lot of them were quite cheap. You didn't have to, you don't have to break the bank to get a, a decent collection of, uh, of books going that, that uh, explain things. And so I started buying these books and then uh, uh, I was going out, out to secondhand bookshops and scouring those. We have a lot of those here in England. Um, they clean out the libraries and the university's uh, libraries and these books wind their way to these charity shops and you can go in and pick them up for a few pounds. And some of the stuff I, you know, I got, I've got a book on Operation Paperclip for sort of three pounds from a charity shop. And I'd never heard of Operation Paperclip, and that had never been taught to me before. But there's a book out there that explains it and describes it. So I grabbed that. And then at some point, I thought I was sitting looking at this uh, ever-growing pile of books, and I thought, do you know what? It's kind of silly of me to just sit here with these books. Uh, I've got to I've got to get this information out. So what can I do? Well, I can start reading them and making book reviews. And that is what led to the creation of the channel. And so I initially began just making out. I'd read a book underline some quotes and then I do an hour just talking about it uh, and the things I learned and read a few quotes and give my impressions of the books. And then I eventually morphed into live streams where I just read books in their entirety from cover to cover. So that's currently what I'm doing. Um, oh, we wow. finished, I think so we finished like doing like live audio books essentially. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly. crazy. It's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. <laughs> I bet a lot of a lot of hours though. I mean, like each video is like three hours long. <laughs> wow! So, so what of of those since you started doing that format? Uh, what has been the longest so far in terms of of um, consuming the most live stream time? Because I'd imagine be, you get you get like distracted with tangents while you're reading, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I often describe it like, you know, you know, you see these videos of people reacting to things, uh, people, or sometimes a video of somebody watching another video and reacting to it. I'm kind of doing that, but to books, you know, so I, I'll, I'll be just reading it out. I got the book cam up and running as well. So I, I show the, you know, the page I'm on and, and then if something springs out or pops into my mind or I make a connection, then I'll go on a little tangent and, and explain what I'm thinking. Um, but yeah, the one that took up the most amount of airtime was Fabian Freeway. I think that took us 14 videos to get through. And as I mentioned, each video is roughly three hours long. So that's quite a, took up quite a chunk of time, small, small text in that book. <laughs> wow. So what, what book did you start the channel with? I believe, I think the first one I did was the open conspiracy by HG Wells, if I remember rightly. What I found did, an old copy of that and um, it was, I don't know, two pound or something uh, from like a oh, reprint from the fifties or something like that. Oh, wow. Um, Cause so that, that's thought, one I haven't had a chance to read yet and I've been looking for it. I want to get my hands on a physical copy of it. So what yeah, was your, what was your so impression of that work and, and of Wells as a result of by the time you got to the end of it? These guys, Wells is so arrogant, incredibly arrogant. I thought, and the idea, but, but also very brazen, you know, there's, there's the, I'm sure you, you'll have heard it said in a lot of the truth of content and the sort of sphere that we swim in, that the plan has to be revealed to us ahead of time. You know, what, what our overlords are doing, they will tell us. And then, then we've had the opportunity to pipe up and say, Hey, don't do that. Uh, but because not enough of us said stop and said, no, 
the plan goes on and 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 it's our fault for letting it happen there's right. some weird karma escape clause uh loophole there that they've put in right and right. i feel like Which this I, don't, World, I don't necessarily believe 100 percent, but i know there are people out there that do and if and again, if we're supposed to take that as legitimate, then we're supposed to believe that the powers that shouldn't be absolutely believe that it's true. So if they believe that, then they would be doing that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, that's what it kind of feels like to me reading the uh, open conspiracy. It's, it's just a revelation of the, the mindset of the people who plan things, uh, particularly in a much longer time frame than we tend to plan. Most of us, you know, are living sort of week to week, month to month, paycheck to paycheck kind of lives uh, just through the economic necessities that we uh, are um, born into. These guys like H.G. Wells, they're looking far out into the future, you know, um, and and so the open conspiracy was just talking about how there was going to have to be this like, like a lot of these writers, there's going to have to be a top down scientific one world government <laughs> because that's the only way we're going to prevent war. Right. Control everybody, control everything uh, and leave it to science. And then that way we'll all be happy and peaceful and calm and under control. And there won't be any chance of, uh, you know, death and destruction and mayhem happening. Allegedly. We'll locked it all yeah. down. Allegedly. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great strategy on paper. Absolutely great strategy on paper. It sounds good. Yeah, it does sound good in theory. Unfortunately, it just doesn't work that way in the real world. But the, I, again, you have to give these people credit, right? Because they don't stop trying. You know, they are dedicated to, uh, to trying to make that happen. Exactly. And they have been for a long time. And they raise their, you know, their offspring uh, to, to take over that, take over the reins and to, to, to uh, advance the same agenda. And so that's really what I'm trying to uncover in these book readings. So, for example, we went from Open Conspiracy by H.G. Wells. We did a book on, uh, by Bertrand Russell as well, Has Man a Future, which kind of amounted to a lot of uh, nuclear war fear porn. And, you know, let's scare everybody with nuclear weapons. And then the solution is, well, a one world government would prevent anyone from using nuclear weapons. So let's have a scientific techno technocratic <laughs> system of control because then there won't be any nuclear weapons because look how terrible nuclear weapons are, you know. I'm starting so to sense teams. a theme here. Yes, yes, yeah. I could be wrong, though. I could be wrong. So uh, what is the uh, – so you said recently you had done Fabian Freeway. Is that the, the most recent book that you have tackled or is there something even newer than that? There's something even newer. We did we did Fabian Freeway, uh, and then after that we did The Next Million Years by Charles Galton Darwin, and that was quite a short book. That only we got through we ripped through that in uh, five videos. And currently, well, I won't tell you what we're doing currently. We'll leave that for a little bit later in the episode. But uh, Next Million Years was a, a similar thing as well, um, because very similar to the uh, H.G. Wells book, this idea that everything. Everything is predictable. It's a, it's a mechanistic universe. It's fixed, and we know exactly what's going to happen. Negating free will, negating the importance of the individual, and uh, interestingly, he opens the book with this metaphor where he says, you know, if we look at the behavior of molecules of gas in a container, then we can predict. We don't need to know what individual molecules do when they interact. We just want to know what what happens on average. What's the average interaction of all the molecules? And in the same way, we can predict the future of humanity. Uh, and he rolls that out to the next million years and um, sort of predicts uh, similar things to, to what H.G. Wells predicted or talked about or wrote about, I should say, in his book, The uh, Time Machine, with the two uh, species of humans, one living right. underground. Where there's a divergence and, in the human species at some point. Yes. So uh, Charles Galton Darwin, he was playing with the same kind of themes and ideas in his book, The Next Million Years. Um, he was talking in there about injections to alter the moral and intellect of the individual, which is quite curious. This is this book was written in 1953. Hold on. Can you repeat that phrase one more time for the folks who didn't quite catch it the first time? Yes. He talks about injections to hormone injections to alter the moral and intellect of the individual. I underlined that bit and I stuck a picture of it on Instagram. 
if anybody wants to go and uh, fact check me. He did really say that. <laughs> Hormone injections to alter the moral and intellectual makeup of the individual. In print, even. Yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. And so what, what's really great about these books is I'll, I'll tend to do a little bit of um, background research or contextual reading. And what I, tend, what I usually do is I'll go to Wikipedia and I tend to describe Wikipedia as this is, this is where you learn what you're supposed to think about something. But even though it's tightly controlled and unreliable as a source, you can still get some nuggets of revelation and interesting things admitted on there. Um, so I'll go there and I'll read about these people, these, these, maybe the authors or maybe the ideas that they're talking about first, and then we'll go through the book uh, and then sort of compare and contrast. And um, yeah, it's a really useful exercise, but that that's those those are the, those are the kind of themes that keep popping up. Um, <laughs> it's quite it's quite interesting because w the 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 good thing about the work and doing this kind of work and reading the books and turning to the books is that when people are saying, "Oh, you're a crazy conspiracy theorist," you'd be like, "No, they actually wrote a whole book about it." You know, you can say like, uh, for example, well, there's that they're, they're trying to set up this this one world control system. You know, and people might say, "Well, that's that's silly," and you can say, "Well." What about this book here? It's International Government. It was written in 1904 by uh, Virginia Woolf's husband and the Fabian Society. You know, and then you say, and then you say, well, who are the Fabian Society? And you say, well, the Fabian Society founded, uh, or or at least uh, were some of the people who founded the British Labour Party, who who just got elected and who were running the country at the moment. And then it all connects, you know. And so when you've got these books and these artifacts to point to and show to people and explain to people, it makes your crazy conspiracy ramblings a lot more uh, <laughs> intriguing and interesting and uh, uh, pers persuasive. Right. And I would think that it would also make your arguments more accessible to people when you can actually point to the book and the page and the passage on the page. We're like, no, this is actually where they said it. I'm taking it verbatim from the language that they chose to publish in this book right here. It's on this page, right? Um, it, it becomes almost impossible. I mean, well, it is essentially impossible to refute at that point. But again, we're dealing with people that don't have the, the strongest intellectual leanings to begin with. Um, Too many injections. Right, right. So have you, have you had a chance in your <clears throat> regular life to actually make some of these arguments to, you know, people that, um, that you have encountered out in the world? Uh, I tend to not go out in the world if I can avoid it. <laughs> God damn it. You're just like the rest of us. <laughs> I figure if I stick it on YouTube, you know, maybe somebody out there in the world will hear it, but no, not so much. I'm at the minute I'm living, uh, in a very small town. I'm, I'm back in my hometown, in fact. So, uh, I really only see family members. And they kind of know my positions on things, and we've sort of agreed to uh, not ruffle each other's feathers by talking about certain topics at this point. Um, it's just we've tried, we've tried, you know. Yeah. And uh, and then beyond that, um, it's kind of I work from home, so it's a lot of video calls, and and actually the people I work with tend to, you know, they like government, and they like their. Uh, um, sort of taxes to be spent on protection protecting them from the from the bad guys out there in the world and and so i don't bring up these kind of things there either <laughs> that's why i'm trying to uh build up haze reviews and get it into something that pays the bills so that i can do it full time and, and then work more on on getting it out to people and, and doing exactly what you just mentioned because i recognize that that is the next step it's all well and good me having these books and talking about them to my little uh you know group on the internet but we, as a as people who do this, need to find out how to get it out there to other people and talk to other people about it. So, uh, I've been quite. Uh, I was glad that we did the Fabian Freeway book on the channel, because um, with the election and then finding out how what a key role they played in the establishment of the the Labour Party and then the election that just came up, um, it gives a nice thread to to uh, it gives a good way in to say to people when they're saying, oh, what, what the hell's going on in this country? I can't believe Labour are doing this. And it's like, well, I can, because <laughs> they were founded by socialists uh, who had a um, wolf in sheep clothing uh, as their logo. And the motto was to uh, remold it 
and by it they mean the world remold it nearer to the heart's desire so that is why they are heat the, and in the and in their window they have a globe and it is it's been heating up with fire and they're smacking it with hammers and uh and mold remolding it and so that's why as a society we're being heated up we're being slow boiled you know and then occasionally we get whacked if we uh if we go and protest about it <laughs> that is uh, a fantastic analogy i've never heard anybody put it exactly that way but when you say it like that it makes perfect sense cuz the other thing too is you can't let it get too hot right otherwise it'll, it'll just melt and, and go everywhere and you got nothing you're back to square one so yeah you have to keep it just at that that perfect temperature to where like you said if, if it starts getting a little squirrely you just take the hammer and smack it yeah and it goes right back yeah. <laughs> they've been working on it a long time that was that's the other thing uh you know the the fabian society they formed i think their first meeting was 1884 and um, wow. there's an excellent truth stream media video about their window, their infamous window. And in that video, he say, I think Aaron says that the book Orwell's 1984 was, he picked that year because 1984 would be 100 years after the Fabians first met and got together and decided they were going to do, you know, what, the, what they were going to do. Right. Um, I don't know what the evidence is for that, but I like it. I think it makes uh, it's a good, I, I hope it's true. No, uh, I mean, it, again, if if we're supposed to believe the things about Eric Blair that we've been able to uncover as far as uh, his affiliations and political leanings and all of those sorts of things, uh, it definitely would make for a wonderful story. I'd like to I'd like to see some con concrete evidence of that at some point, because um, it, it seems like a thread that's missing from the tapestry. You know. So yeah, how know. how do you go about uh, selecting each book? Like as you as you progress, right? Like mm -hmm. is there have you have you de developed a method yet? Does like one book lead you to the next one? How how does that work for you? Great question. Yeah, I have developed a method, um, and the method is I ask the people in my Telegram group. I give them three options and then we put it to a poll and then we just, uh, you know, the, the one that comes out on, we do it democratically in other words. Uh, <laughs> um, but what we did on the last one was I put up a, um, poll with three books on and they were, they were all pretty good books and they were all books I wanted to read. So instead of just reading the winner, I said, we'll do all three in order that, uh, they came in. So that's why we started with the next million years. Cause that was the winner. And then, uh, we're actually on this one now I'll reveal it. I know everybody's been waiting for it. This is The Fearful oh. Master by G. Edward Griffin. And so this is the one we're doing at the moment. And then after this one, we're going on to The Milner Fabian Conspiracy by Eowyn Ratu, which is... Um, that's, a, that's a big one, book. yeah. It's a 2012 book, and I uh, heard about it on Jay Dyer's show and managed to track down a copy because they are um, hard to find and really overpriced at the, at the moment. Uh, or last time I looked, they were, I think they were 60 or $90 or something. Um, oh, wow. That's low that comparatively. Cheap. Like <laughs> I've gone, I've gone looking for some books and they're like a couple grand. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. Maybe one day we'll put that on the wish list. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, it's amazing what you can get uh, if you, yeah, it's, I mean, I think sometimes the watching the prices go up and down and fluctuate and which books are expensive and which are cheap has really been fascinating because Amazon cranks the prices up quite often um, on certain titles and you can't really figure out why. Like, I just got this one. Uh, this is Spies, Lies, and Whistleblowers, MI5, MI6, and The Shaler Affair. So this is this uh, guy on the cover is David Shaler, and this woman who wrote the book is Annie Mac Macon, and they were working in MI5. And they saw lots of dodgy stuff and they wanted to blow the whistle and she's written this book about it. And then since that whole episode happened, David Shaler has um, declared himself as uh, Christ incarnate and now he's become a woman and uh, he lives on a farm somewhere in England. So I don't know if that's his punishment for trying well, to blow the whistle on MI5. <laughs> wow. That certainly escalated quickly. It did. But that book, for example, was 
pretty high. It was, you know, it was, it was quite pricey for a while. And I just keep my eye on it. I check in every so often. And if for some, if somebody puts up a secondhand coffee, coffee for cheap, and then I'll just grab it and, and add it to the, uh, to the collection. But to go back to your original question about choosing the next book. Yeah, that's, that's my, my goal now is to just, uh, once we've finished the book, I'll just pick three. And then as a community, I'm trying to like include the audience, uh, and, and let's make this into a sort of learning journey that we all go on together not with not so much about Nick, but it's more about, Hey, I've got this library. Let's all explore it and learn from it, you know, together. And, and then we can all benefit from the knowledge within. Um, and I think, uh, it's, it's quite a novel way to do things. You know, you get to, mm -hmm. you get to have a bit of a stake in the, the content and steer the ship. And, um, it makes it a little more uh, exciting when we can wind our way through, through this, this kind of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, landscape together. Yeah. It's good fun. Well, I'm sure one of the things that you have discovered that I also learned along the way in the course of building Liberty Radio is that every now and then, and it doesn't happen like every day or every week, you can't, you can't put it on, on a schedule or anything like that, but every so often, somebody from the community will speak up and just have an absolute genius idea that I would never have thought of myself in a million years. And, and it's moments like that are just like invaluable. Like you can't, as far as I'm concerned, you can't put a price on something like that. So it's people who actually put the time and effort into including their audience as part of a production process, find these little gems and everybody else misses out on them. Um, I don't know what you, what you think about that, but it's something that, that I've noticed kind of along the way. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so, you know, there'll be times when I'm, I'm, I'm a bit sleepy or I don't really, I'm not feeling it and I don't want to do a stream maybe because I've, I've usually worked all day and I, I stream like 7 PM UK time. I can be pretty low energy, but by the end of every single stream I've ever done, I'm always so hyped up and excited and it's all down to that interaction. Cause some people, they showed up and they, you know, like, checked they just checked in on the chat and they gave some feedback and i'll read some of those comments out and it's just i'm so uplifted and and i always go to like i i, I like it takes me longer to get to sleep after doing a live stream because i'm like mm -hmm. energized by it <laughs> you know I, I work and get drained and then like doing the live stream does the opposite so yeah and the other nice thing is when i come across words that i don't know which happens occasionally i can get someone in the chat i say hey can somebody just you know, look that up and drop the uh, definition in the chat and they'll, they'll do that for me. And if there's some, something I don't understand or I can, I can ask them and they'll fact check me in real time. And that's really useful. So I, they keep me on the straight and narrow. So I'm not just, uh, imagining things cause I'm not like super, um, memory palace type of person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get things wrong all the time. So having the community there to kind of like, you know, hold you up while you're wobbling and trying to do your thing is, um, it's really uplifting. It really fills my heart with a lot of joy uh, and, I, and I absolutely love it. Yeah. Well, and it is the, the one thing that I think we all need to be doing in order to combat the system that we are fighting against. Because uh, again, the, the, the parasite class is trying to consolidate power uh, under their control system as far as we can tell. From the best available evidence, that is what is going on. There's a very small group of people in the world that is trying to enslave everybody else and make sure that it sticks for the rest of time, right? Yep. And in my best solution to that so far has been community building. You know, getting like-minded people together so that they can build a support structure themselves that they can utilize and rely on so they don't have to worry about whatever the hell else is going on in the world. So exactly. Yeah. Well said. Um, I mean, I, I, I agree 100%. And, uh, you know, the, ang so the angle that I come in at is cause I did actually start live streaming and I was going through news and I was doing news articles and I would, I had a format where I would start with mainstream stuff, you know, dailymail.com, these mainstream, uh, tabloid sort of headlines and stories. And I would throughout the course of the episode, I would shift gradually away to the, uh, alternative voices. You know, maybe your Ian Davies or your Off Guardian and these kind of places. And by the end, I would be recommending books 
and looking at the alternative news. And that was kind of the journey and the arc. And I, But after a while, I thought, you know, there's plenty of people out there doing the news uh, and doing it in a more entertaining way. And, you know, Grand Theft World, they do it with the best sort of historical linking and context providing. So I thought maybe I could do something a little different. And maybe the people who are tired and exhausted and wound up by this constant barrage of things going wrong and crazy things happening and psyops, it's, it's exhausting, right? Why don't we just slow down a little bit? Why don't we just take a step back and, and, and sort of take a slower pace and go on a journey with an author and read a book? And, uh, and I really like that idea that people who are very strung out because of trying to keep up and follow this crazy news cycle that's bombarded that we're bombarded with every day well there's there's you know you can you can unplug from that and plug into something that's a little uh, a different pace and and because it's all words and reading and text and it's not visual it's not very um you know it's not kind of um edited and polished it's 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 a it's a more relaxing way to to learn and educate yourself and get good information about the world and what's going on in these in these kinds of agendas so uh, that's what i thought i would kind of bring to the table an offer and uh, yeah i think it's going pretty well I'm, I'm very happy with it i like i like it i love doing it i wish i could do more of it but uh three three live streams a week is is about as much as wow. i can manage at the moment yeah you're doing three live streams a week that that is impressive just on its own especially if you're doing you know three four hours at a time because that's that's a pretty significant time commitment right there it does take up a bit of time but the good thing is there's not much prep involved because i just open the book and read it. Right. So I don't really need to do lots beforehand. Um, I can just kind of show up with the book, crack it open, give a, give my thoughts, maybe do a recap where we left off and then just dive right in and read. So, um, but yeah, Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays is when I was, uh, that's what I aim for. I, I miss the old one. If I have other things going on, obviously life gets in the way, but, um, it's definitely, I think, uh, a good, a good thing to do and to encourage any community to do is to get a good store of books and start stocking up because well in the uk at least one of the outcomes of all this recent um unrest is you know greater control of social media and more policing of online content they're locking people up for tweeting uh or xing or whatever it's called and they're coming after those who spread certain information online you know and uh, until we get to the point where they come after people for reading books, I don't know. I guess we're about six months to a year away from that. But uh, <laughs> but depending depending on how things shake out over the next week or so, I would say. Uh, yep, we'll and I f I figured we were eventually going to get around to that subject, just because it's in the headlines right now. Um, so, can you encapsulate what has occurred in Britain? over the course of the last week or so? Oh, man. <laughs> I can give it a go. But as I mentioned, I don't actually follow things too closely because I'm, I'm trying to be more uh, book-oriented now and trying to right. be a bit more... But Well, I figure being, being in the general area where it's happening, there's a, a good chance that you're privy to information that is not leaking out to the outside world. So that's why I ask. Yeah, I can tell you what I know. Because um, I was in Manchester uh, last Friday, which is one of the places where these these things occurred, these events. And then the following day, I was watching the same, you know, a live stream of the place where I was walking the previous day. Uh, and the police were there and there was different groups there. So what happened was uh, there was a media blitz with a headline and a story about how a young uh, a dance class of for young girls was um, invaded. A maniac went in there on a stabbing spree. Three girls died and a bunch of others were injured. Um, I have not looked into that story. I have no idea if it's the veracity or the, the details. So, but, but that was on the news and, and everybody got bombarded with that message. Um, then there was a lot of confusion and misleading information about his uh, identity what country he was from, uh, his religion. And so people started playing the blame game and they want to find out who, who it was and what led to it and what his motives were. And I don't even think that's been cleared up now uh, at this point. I don't, I'm not sure it might have done by now, but I don't think it's been cleared up yet. And so because it, was, it, it came out that this gentleman was 
his parents were were immigrants and he was born here in the uk um a lot of these protests were arranged by who <laughs> who knows but all these protests in these different places were arranged and uh, they were going to be kind of anti-immigration protests because uh like you know like you guys over in the states uh, and the rest of europe there there is a unchecked flow of people coming into our countries and um both legal by legal routes and illegal routes and it's quite concerning for people who are who are watching their communities and the areas around them change rapidly and they've had no say in it and suddenly you don't you know the people around you have a totally different way of life dress religion uh um cuisine all these kind of things you're seeing your communities transform and so that's been happening for quite a while and then that was the tinder with which the 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 flame of this new story of the stabbings set alight and then all these um protests were arranged but from what i can gather and from what i saw not that many people actually turned up to the protests so it was it was over exaggerated very very much in the media and they got a few clips of chaos there was some chaos there was some uh, violence and 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 damage but nowhere near as much as they wanted to portray in the media and all the live streams and the live feeds that i watched were quite small contingents of people and and nothing nothing like the size of for example lockdown protests or blm marches over the last few years with those two wow. events had way more people there this was quite small um and, and not as not as the scale was not as big as as the media wanted to project you know so where i live nothing happened business as usual we've had lovely weather people have been enjoying that um it's been it's been a really nice week and and uh the videos that i watched of manchester there was there was there was more like counter protesters turning up right so the original protests were anti-immigration protests and then you know then then the counter protest turned up protesting the protest <laughs> and they were all the an antifa kind of people and you know refugees welcome here kind of people more of them turned up than the actual uh far right and that was the other thing that happened the media labeled all the agitators and all the troublemakers as far right and far right, the far right of the surprise, surprise. Right of the country yeah, yeah i know who could have seen that one coming right <laughs> So does that kind of tally with with what you've sort of heard and, and what your impressions were or is that different? I mean that's that's been the I would call it the general narrative so far the where the questions are really coming in is uh who is organizing the protests you know where's where's the funding coming from all of that on both sides both the protests and the counter protesters um people have have been uh trying to uncover that information and uh not being as successful as as they would want to um so it's been a little bit difficult up to this point and then of course there's the um the the absolute knee-jerk reaction by the government to start throwing people in a cage for posts on social media which is like about as tyrannical as you can get. We don't like what you say, so we're going to lock you up. That's that's essentially what we're being told is happening over there. Is is that part of it accurate? Yeah, and that's that's already been happening. So, have you heard of Sam Melia? Uh name doesn't sound familiar. So Sam Melia, uh he created what was called the white rose uh, and it was um, okay. stickers, I've heard of the white, white rose white yeah. rose stickers right so he made this uh sticker bundle the white rose stickers and you could buy yourself a little printer and you could download the stickers print them out and and go around sticking them and this was during lockdowns and so it was you know getting people to ask some questions and try and think logically about what was going on to realize that none of it made any sense none of the none of the mainstream messaging made any sense right and he he was he was um prosecuted for i don't know what it was exactly um but i can't remember the charge but during the court proceedings the court admitted the prosecution admitted that he hadn't that all the contents of the stickers they were all factually true because he hadn't said anything that he hadn't lied he hadn't like done any any said anything that wasn't factually true uh, and they also admitted that um that the contents were factually true 
and that and I think that that he hadn't broken any laws in 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 ma- in designing, and they still sent him down. And not only did they send him down, put him in prison, they uh, they said that he was a, a dangerous a danger to young young people. You know, he was a sort of I don't know, not a terrorist, but wait, they wait, said wait, he's wait, a hold on, hold on, hold on, back up a minute because <laughs> my yeah, yeah. I just had an alarm go off in my brain. So they convicted him and sentenced him while simultaneously admitting that he had not broken any laws. Yeah, yeah, for the contents of these stickers. You got to look this case up and get the detail because it was a while ago when I looked at it, but it was wow, it's crazy. And he, he has two daughters, uh, I think two daughters, uh, or, or at least he has one daughter and his wife's pregnant, something like that. Um, and they've said that he's uh, not allowed to see his children and his family because he's a threat you know, and, and it's not safe. Um, and so they've, yeah, they've, and I think, I don't even know how long he's been in now, maybe eight months, six months, eight months, something like that. But, you know, for anyone concerned about free speech, particularly in the UK, that's, that, that is a case that people need to be jumping up and down and shouting about because he, they, they, the, the prosecution admitted no laws were broken and everything he wrote on the stickers was factually accurate. So that's that's already happening is my point is they're already doing people for um nonsense charges that they they're, they're just making up for wrong think and wrong speak basically so how how long have the authorities uh the law enforcement arm in england been going around and harassing people uh essentially about their posts on social media how many like how many months years how long has this been going on it was definitely going on during lockdowns. I don't know about before that. Uh, like, as I mentioned, kind of at the very beginning, I was sort of blissfully unaware living my life uh, <laughs> in normie land up until lockdowns began. So my my memory kind of only goes back that far in terms of uh, paying attention to things and seeing what's going on. But, but, they, but it was happening then. You know, people sh- spreading misinformation online would get a knock on the door and the police would turn around and we're arresting you because somebody's complained about something you put on Facebook. Um, these kind of videos I saw being shared in, in telegram groups. And mm-hmm. so it's going on, I think. And uh, people need to be very careful now about what they share and what they post. And, and uh, I think it's, it, you know, they pick and choose. That's the other thing. So the, the big, the big, um, phrase that's been going around at the minute is two tier Kier. You've probably heard that one. I have not heard, heard that? that one. What does it mean? All right. So Kier, Kier Starmer, he is our um, current incumbent, yeah. uh, graceful, Prime masterful Minister Stalin, leader. Yeah. yeah. And uh, two tier Kier, two tier refers to the two tiered policing system, whereby if you are protesting, um, you know, on behalf of George Floyd and BLM, then you are noble and graceful and to be or celebrated. Or the climate, I would imagine. Yes, exactly. If you are defacing Stonehenge or um, slashing priceless portraits of, you know, uh, slave Our owners. Our beloved or king. How dare those children? <laughs> then then you're fine. But if you are, uh, yeah, if you're protesting lockdowns, then you get a very brutal, heavy-handed, kettling-type um, treatment from the police. So it's... um. It's two tier, and uh, and that's kind of what unfolded. And we saw videos of, and and again, these days with AI and, and video generation, I I be I try to be very skeptical of anything I see, mm-hmm. you know, picture, video, audio. Um, this is another reason. Again, I know I'm I'm harping on about it, but another reason to go back to books, right? Is because I don't think they've figured out how to kind of fully generate the uh, you know the whole book, and uh, but I'm sure they're not far off. Uh, but anyway. Um, they were, they were saying, um, the, the videos I was seeing were of the sort of white, um, population getting much harsher treatment than, for example, gangs of Muslims with, uh, various weapons marching around. Okay. <laughs> and you know, videos, miss context, you don't know what happened before and after you just see a little right. snippet. So I'm not saying what is true but this is what people are getting fed by the algorithms by the social media and so this is where this this two-tier care um phrases come from and i think again it's been happening a long time it's not a new thing it's not just started under this pr- prime minister it's been it's been going on at least four years um so we got to ask the question why is it being pushed into the mass 
consciousness now at this point when it's been ongoing for quite a while and there's plenty of us who've been pointing it out and trying to raise awareness of it right suddenly it's being uh kind of uh, allowed to be talked about and widely uh, widely spread so what's the reason for that do you have a theory on that have you Maybe. have you had long enough to develop one i i feel like i think they want to just justify okay so the 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 black pill kind of theory that i that i've sort of played with is is due to listening to a parallel mic of mm -hmm. uh, the parallel systems broadcast and he talks about uh he's one of the only sort of financial analysts that i can understand i'm not very financially literate i don't really understand money and investing and all that kind of stuff but mike i i understand his his explanations and mm -hmm. and he's been covering this thing called the great taking david rogers webb came out with a book about how the legal mechanisms have been put in place for all paper assets to be taken in the case of some sort of crash and and given to these protected investors or protected something or other um and and so my sort of theory is they want to get a, enough control enough of a police presence to dampen down the chaos that's going to erupt from a from a sort of a market or a financial collapse or a crash so i think um when that if that happens they're going to need a narrative to give us a narrative they can't be like yeah well the system was rigged to do this from the beginning <laughs> so right. they're going to have to give us an event to blame it on um and so maybe this is kind of warming us up for that and so uh, it could be just a case of you know um stoke the discontent get the get some get some um incidents going get people crazy oh that you need to be tougher on these uh these these gangs and these groups and yeah. and then you get more of a police presence and then when shit really hits the fan you got the police out there ready to um you know keep on top of it yeah i don't know it, it's well, a it, theory, but... as as i see it it is the the pendulum swinging back to the other side right because uh, 2020 and the lead up to it, you had the, the pendulum swinging towards the left, defund the police. And, and that wasn't just in the United States. That had spillover into other countries, specifically other Western countries like Australia, Great Britain, Canada, yada, yada, yada. You keep going right on down the line. All the Commonwealth countries were getting the same treatment. It was just different flavors of the same treatment, right? So all of the law enforcement was being um, sorted during the scandemic, I think is, is probably the most diplomatic way that I can put it, to make sure that the conscientious objectors were not going to be a part of the force by the time that it came uh, or by by the yeah by the time that it came to put boots on necks right they want to make sure that everybody that's in the ranks is an order follower right and now we're having that pendulum swing back after the thinning out to where they're going to start bringing more people in because as you're saying it's almost go time whatever it's going to be that allows the state to uh, begin exercising its mechanisms upon the public. We have no idea what it's going to be. I don't, I don't even know if the parasite class knows exactly what it's going to be yet. Because if you look at the trend over the last decade or so, right, they've been practicing this disaster capitalism bullshit where you wait for a legitimate event to happen and then you fucking swoop in and take over the operations and squeeze every last fucking penny from it that you possibly can. And oh, hopefully along the way, you manage to erode a few more civil liberties, too. I think that's that's basically the playbook that they've been operating from, I say, since, since basically about 9-11, but especially since the the alleged economic crash in 2008. There, there are just so many variables at play in the world right now that it's a matter of time until a major event happens. I think that's kind of um, where we're at. But yeah, I can see this setting up for whatever that ultimately turns out to be.
And if the population doesn't push back hard enough on the government's response to what is happening right now, well, then that's just gravy on top, isn't it? Yeah, really good, actually. Great points there. And what you mentioned as well about, you know, getting rid of everybody with conscience from not only the military, but also the uh, medical systems, yep. you know, the doctors, the nurses, the NHS over here in England, uh, teaching profession. A lot of teachers resigned. There's um, there's a guy I listen to. He's, he's from a town near me on YouTube, and he's on YouTube called Nigel Watson. And he went out, he, he basically jacked in his job. He was an economics teacher. Uh, and he jacked in his job because he wouldn't wear the mask and he wouldn't bend the knee and he wouldn't do all that stuff. Went over, lives in Finland now and makes YouTube videos. And um, I chat to him occasionally. So you've got you've got him out of the schools and the education system. You've got the people, the good people out of the medical, and you've got him out of the uh, the military and the and the police. And um, and then when they need to bolster those numbers, they've been bringing people in. You know, they've been bringing people in so they can go, all right, well, we, you know, we're, you're here now. We've got a job for you. Here's a, here's a trungeon. And, well, it's probably not a trungeon. Here's a can of pepper spray and a set of handcuffs and a, and a checkerboard hat and uh, a tactical vest. And you can go and walk up and down the street and smack anyone in the face who tries to leave their home. You know, you can see it. You can see that happening um, if, if they declare some sort of emergency. And they just say, all right, well, we need to we need to double the number of people in the police. Oh, it just so happens that we have all these hotels here full of uh, people who arrived on small boats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wouldn't, don't you want to see them working and paying taxes and paying into the system and not? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> give oh, them a we job. Can, make we them can work. give them, them jobs in our new enforcement agency. It's, it's perfect. It's a win win yeah. for everyone except the voter. But we're just not going to say that part. <laughs> don't say that. Don't mention that. Yeah. No. But I mean, the the vote to mention actually, though, the, but to to mention the vote at the minute, the uh, the turnout was pretty dismal this year, and I think um, this this uh, this government got in with kind of a record number of of you know lowest votes in a long time. If if I understood that correctly, when I was looking at the numbers, they got something like I don't know in the end maybe thirty percent of the people who did vote, and uh, and I think half eligible voters didn't something like that so it was only a minority a fraction of the population that got right. got this group in most people i think uh or the vast majority of people now are, are really um probably they, they just don't see themselves taken care of or represented or looked after um and and you can see that the country is being sort of um transformed rapidly and not for the benefit of those of us who were who were born here whose ancestors were born here who who have been here, you know, generationally much longer. Um, and there's some pretty frightening statistics and, and infographics as well about like the, the, the um, London, for example, and how 20 years ago, the demographics have changed in the last 20 years mm -hmm. to where the mo most of the city is, is minority white at this point in, in just 20 years, you know, and I don't care about people's color really. It's all about the content of your character and who, you know, the things you do and, and the way you treat people. But for a, for a country's capital city to change in 20 years that drastically, that tells you something's going on. There's a big transformation. There's a big change happening. And you mm -hmm. weren't asked about it. You didn't get a say in it. You didn't say you weren't uh, in, invited to to give your thoughts about it. It was just done to you. Who by? You know, it's the, it's the parasites, isn't it? But but they got to vote on it, Nick. Everybody had a chance to vote, right? You you got to say your piece through your vote. Right? That's your voice. That's what we're told. That's the propaganda, right? Exactly. So they didn't have, have good, their um, chance. Yeah, they did. But I, I had a good friend I used to work with, and, and she always used to say she didn't vote because um, she didn't believe in choosing between the, the kitten punchers and the puppy kickers. Right. right. Which is <laughs> solid logic. I can't argue with that at all. It's, it's the same logic that I employ. I'm like, all right, so wait a minute. You're telling me that one of these guys is a lesser evil? So then that means no matter who I pick, I'm voting for evil. All right, that's, that's no win. I can't participate in that. That's a closed system. No. Exactly. And actually, that just reminds me, um, just to, to sort of get back on the topic of books briefly as well, there's, 
I, I believe I'm right in saying, and this is another good angle as well for talking to people about these kind of things and a way in, is that the, the isn't like the number one cause of death in the 20th century death by government. Government, yeah. Government right. killed way more people in the 20th century than any other cause. Yeah. And there's a guy who wrote a bunch of books on it. I forget his name, and I don't have his books yet, but he's, he's one of those that I keep meaning to get around to adding to the library and and talking to people about but yeah that that kind of fact pointing that out to people who are who are who are very keen staunch supporters uh and and that's that's a very important one to throw around and, and remind people of hmm. if you can get them to believe you that's always the hardest part isn't it well speaking of the uh the future in the near future as we have been and books to get back on topic uh what is on your wish list for the near future that you have not had a chance to tackle yet? In terms of reading, yeah, on the channel. Oh my goodness! So, I'll show you. I'll show you one that I got. Okay, uh, uh, too many, too many, man. I don't even know where to start. I'll, I'll, I'll give you these three. I did actually pull these three to talk about. So I got a um, a really awesome community and 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 group who um support my work and show up and, and participate and i had this sent over to me the first global revolution oh wow have you heard of that one i have not who's the author alexander king and bertrand schneider this is a report by the council of the club of rome ah okay all right and so this has a very famous quote in it about in searching something I think it's the one about, I might be getting this wrong. I hope I'm not getting it wrong. But it's the, it's the one about in searching for a, an en a common enemy to unite men, we, de we decided that climate change would fit the bill and the gotcha. enemy ha of man is, is man himself. So it's basically this admission that, oh, if we, if we terrorize people with the weather Didn't they and tell steal them to stay that? I thought that was in Limits to Growth. Oh, maybe that's Limits to Growth that's got that one. Yeah. And this which, is the which I mean, it's the same people. So it's obviously the people. They, would, they would plagiarize themselves. I think you're right. And that's the follow up to Limited Growth. So I'm very excited to uh, read that. Okay. One. All right. Um, yeah. So this, so it says it rivals in importance the club's earlier report, Limits to Growth. So I think you're right. That's where that first quote's come from. So that's one I'm looking forward to reading. This one I just got uh, through the other day. This is Stanley Johnson. Oh, yeah. I saw you had posted that in the Telegram channel. I'm very jealous. Stanley Johnson, father of Boris. Who you might have heard of Boris Johnson, that's Stanley Johnson there. He combs his hair. Very and, dashing uh, looking gentleman there. <laughs> and uh, just check out that title, man. This is this in a, you know, this, the title of this book tells you the plan in three words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. And, uh, and if you have a look in the index on this one, he's got things like he's talking about population control, migration as a form of that's in the index. So uh, some interest, and he's talking about sterilization in India. And he also, there's a bit about the Muslim ban on sterilization. And then, of course, the Rockefeller Foundation's in here. Uh, and then there's a whole section on the United Nations. So because we're reading, currently reading A Fearful Master, uh, the G. Edward Griffin book about the United Nations, I thought I would stock up on other books that, that deal with that organization. Because yeah. cause that, they've, nearly, they've almost done it, man. They've almost got all the, all the countries. You know, and they're pretty um, close. Yeah. The problem and is, it, it still, UN still does not have an enforcement mechanism. So it's, it's a paper tiger still. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder where that, I wonder if they're going to be gunning for that eventually and then they'll get that. They'll, they'll well, get we can that talk through. about that too if you want. Because <laughs> there, there is a plan. They always there have is. plans. Oh, yeah. You didn't know that. So, so are you not acquainted with the greater, uh, the Federated States of Greater Israel project? Is, has that come across your radar? Ooh. You might want to write not. that down so you can, oh uh, you can search it up on your own. Let me open a tab. Yeah. <laughs> the Federated, the Federated, Federated States. States of Greater Israel. Uh, and definitely use your your best search tool on that one because Google's probably not going to find it for you. <laughs> wow. Okay. Cool. I will. Yeah. Uh, I will look the, into that. For the, sure. the plan essentially is to uh, reincarnate the United Nations over in the Middle East with 
uh, the global army so that they are capable of protecting the greater uh, states of, of federated Israel. Yeah. That's, that's oh the God. short of it. All right. I, I was not aware of that, but that'll be uh, some very yeah. interesting. Spoiler right? so they did... alert. You know, <laughs> yeah. I probably should have said that at the beginning, huh? It's oh, good, wow. though, because uh, they did the sort of League of Nations, and then uh, we got the United Nations. Uh, and if, as you were saying, like it's it's a bit of a paper tiger, there's nothing there to enforce it. This could be the third time lucky, right? Third time's a yep. charm with this version. So um, interesting. I will definitely keep an eye out for that and, uh, and look into it. So, uh, yeah. Amazing. So that's 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 it. I mean, I got I got every every single book I have behind me is one that I want to read. You know, it's it's I don't just uh, wow. so so in terms of the future of the of the channel, I've got enough material <laughs> to keep me going for a very long time till a ripe old age. Because uh, I tend to, you know, I, and I don't really buy books unless there's something in there that I feel is worth preserving out into the future. Because that's an, that's the other sort of thinking behind this this work and then what i'm doing is that i'm trying to preserve as as the internet becomes increasingly harder to find good information and we might end up being forced to use an eyeball scan of some you know or a thumbprint or something to get on it i don't know some sort of biometrics or i know a, a friend of mine yeah a, a friend of mine was was telling me about how ebay have refused to let him use their their website now if he's on a vpn um huh. so he's he's blocked from using ebay um, unless he unless he turns his VPN off, so I mean it's it's that gradualism, it's that Fabian socialist gradualist tortoise kind of way. But you know, until they start going to all the houses and, and burning the books again, I can at least preserve this information and talk to people about it and share it. You know, in in the real world, if the internet becomes totally untenable uh, at, yeah. at some point. Well, and I think. Uh... The work that you're doing and the work that other people are doing in the media space to help preserve physical media is maybe some of the most important work being done nowadays. Because again, one of the primary reasons why the internet was developed, ladies and gentlemen, was so that they could go back and edit things in real time as they needed to first they needed to get everybody on it and then once that was accomplished it was like all right now we can start doing all the other shit that we want to do with it and you know after one generation doesn't matter anymore because the behavior is already set so trying to break that behavior from people in the future good luck i wish you the best of luck with it probably not going to work but yeah. you know, if that's what that's what you have your heart set on, go for it. So um, you know, just being able to have these repositories of physical media, whatever they are, whether you know, whether it's cassette tapes, whether it's VHS, whether it's books, whether it's newspapers, magazines, doesn't matter. It's still an artifact that somebody else can find somewhere down the road to hopefully help fill in a missing piece of their puzzle so that they can understand the world a little bit better. Yeah, well said. Very well said. And the other thing, the other good, uh, I think, benefit is I think the value of these sort of things will go up, you know, as time goes on. I mean, sometimes I look up, uh, I mean, I'm nearly 40 now, but sometimes I look up toys that I had as a kid to see how oh, much man. they go for on eBay. And I'm just like... Whoa, you know, like the price, I should have kept that Lego set. You know, that I had a castle, it had a little ghost and a trapdoor. This Lego set, it goes for hundreds now. I could have kept that thing. And, you know, all the Thunderbird stuff, Tracy Island, <laughs> oh, action man. man. Oh, holy cow. You'd have like Joe Rogan money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd have a lot more books because I would have sold all that shit and bought books with it probably. Well, but yeah, I, <laughs> but then you still have money left over. So then it's like, psh, screw work. I'm just going to do this full time now. That's it. Be That's Nick, the dream. Nick the audiobook machine. <laughs> but I do think they're gonna go the value's gonna go up. You know, I do I do think um as 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 the agendas unfold, as the totalitarianism becomes more total, uh, you know, and people f cannot keep ignoring it, then then these sort of artifacts that explain the who, the the how, the what, the when the, and the why 
of how we got here, the, they're going to become sought after and they're going to be valuable. So you can even look at it as a kind of store of, of wealth as well. And I do try to get like rarer books. I try to get old ones now. Um, you know, I showed you that international, uh, international government book that's 1904, I think it was. Um, so I try and get books that are older, uh, especially if they're written before the internet, because you know, back in the day, people actually had to put some effort in mm -hmm. to, to get a book written. You yeah. know, you might have to spend a few weeks down an archive in a in a library somewhere. You might have to like seduce the librarian to let you into the uh, you know the the bit of the back that she's not supposed to show to you, you if you don't have the right permit. Um, you might have to travel around, interview different people, uh, read a ton of books yourself. There was no Chat GPT. Hey, give me a give me a you know forty thousand chapter on whatever. Um, so these are, in my view, precious pieces of, of, of treasure and artifacts, exactly the right word. And I, I, I just, um, I think they're so valuable and then you get them and they've been, you know, like, for example, I've got this one over here. I'll just grab it one sec. Yeah, no problem. I'll stall for time while you're grabbing So this it. one is. Cause I'm a professional. The search for the Manchurian candidate. Oh, beautiful. So that shelf over there that I just, that, uh, no, sorry, below that one, this one here that you can't see because of the mic, that's all like mind control CIA, uh, you know, MK ultra type stuff. I found this in a, in a secondhand bookshop, right? It was a no brainer. I just went straight away. Holy I'm going to get crap. it. Three pound, three pound 49. I don't know if you can see it's right at the top there. Three pound 49. So nothing, but inside was this, uh, obituary that somebody had cut out of the paper of Sydney Gottlieb. Wow. From a 1999 painting, uh, paper, newspaper, right? Oh, so wow. So that was in there. And Dude, then please at the back, tell me you've already scanned that as a PDF. No, I have not. Oh, you've got to get that done, page. man. Look at the back. I don't know if you can make that out, but as far as I can tell, it's, it's some sort of calculations for like dosages of LSD. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so the previous owner... I, I, he was pretty serious about his research. I don't know if wow. he was uh, <laughs> trying it, but he's talking about milligrams and micrograms. It was probably just to help. Yeah, talking about thus one tenth of a milligram equals one dose. And he's talking about Hoffman's dose. On, yeah. So, you know, you get these things and other people have been through them and added things and, and sometimes th their own notes. Or, and then like th this one, some, you know, like extra, extra pieces of evidence and artifacts in there as well. So, my advice to anybody out there is get out there in the second hand bookshops and, and start digging around. You, you don't know what you're going to find, you know? Yeah. Um, well, it's like some, the, a couple of months ago, I was digging around in the resale shops here in Jasper and found that one book. I can't remember the title right off the top of my head. I think it's like cloak and gown or something like that. Ooh, um, yeah. yeah Miles I, Copeland. Yeah. I found it for two bucks at a resale <laughs> shop here in little old Jasper. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. There you yeah, are. There's treasure hidden everywhere, folks. And Nick is right. When it, when it comes to things like wealth, monetary value is not everything. Because, again, one of the primary levers of control in the technocratic control grid is information itself. And if you possess information that somebody else does not, by default, that is power. And I consider power to be the same as wealth. So nice. spot on Very again. Much. Sir. Very well said. Yeah, totally agreed. So of all the books that you have covered so far uh, on your channel, Nick, which one has been the most mind blowing for you? Oh, that's a good question. That is a fantastic question. I think so. So I'll, I'll I'll have to pick two, but for different reasons, right? So one we did was uh, Lusitania by Colin Simpson, and this was uh, an a sort of expose, not really an expose, but a a retelling of the Lusitania with all the inconsistencies and strange things included as opposed to the mainstream narrative, which was very straightforward. Here's what happened. And, and this is, this is how it went down. And, you know, and, and it was amazing to read that early account of a, 
I don't know if I would say false flag, but there was certainly a sort of lie hop slash my hop thing going yeah. on with it. And, but it was so harrowing the, 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 the accounts of the passengers and the people on the ship and the things that they went through and the, the people that they lost the survivors, you know, and their first hand accounts. So, you know, I, I thought, oh, this would be good for a little bit of like maybe some truth conspiracy reading. We'll get into the, you know, um, the the nuts and bolts of why the investigation was was a real sham. But actually, the the the, the first hand accounts of the survivors was really heartbreaking and very powerful to read. Uh, and and I was reading it live, you know, as I do. That's and I, and it was kind of very unexpectedly moving. To be reading that live and sharing it with with the with the audience, and I, and it was a very somber moment. It was more somber and than I than I thought it would be to read a book like that. So that was that was quite quite mind blowing to me that it was a very it was just a very special moment because, um, you know, as as sort of researchers and people who are into the ground theft world and understanding it, there's so much horror that you kind of have to become sort. Of, I don't know. Yeah, you, you, you sort of have to confront it. Back and you, you have, have to confront, to confront it. it. Yeah, well said. Yeah, you got to confront it, but you can kind of get become almost not numb to it. Or, but if you're reading about these things over and over and all the time, you can get a little bit, you know, hardened to it. And but you got to remember that, like, these are really horrific things that these people are doing. And I think the Lusitania was an excellent uh, encapsulation of of the horrors and the lengths to which these people will go. Um, and so that was a really powerful one, but in terms of like deepening my understanding of the agendas and how they work, the Fab I think the Fabian freeway, that was a real mind blower. Um, just because it goes back to, like I mentioned, 1884 and the book was written in the sixties. So it brings the story right up to the sixties and talks about how this group and their, with their ideology were infiltrating political parties and universities and uh, labor unions. And they were traveling around the world, giving lectures and propping up different speakers and propping up different authors and playwrights. And it gave me, I think you said earlier in the episode, and it gave me a sort of respect for these psychopaths <laughs> because the, the way they plan, the meticulous level of planning, the long-termism, the way they set their goals and they they move toward it unshakably day after day after day you know many of them dying before the plans will be realized and devoting their whole lives to it there's a there's a sort of respect there uh and and a, and a like okay you gotta you gotta give your opponent some respect because what they're doing is is so it's it's almost like superhuman to have that level of focus and determination and planning and organization you know um, and they breed that out of us and then they sort of tell us that, oh, you're all idiots and you need us to, uh, <laughs> watch over you and make decisions for you. Um, but, but Fabian Freeway really captured that, uh, in, in, in a lot of detail. And it showed us as well how these kind of boring, these, these organizations with boring sounding names who you would not even want to learn about because they sound so boring, you know, are actually carrying out a lot of change and wielding a lot of power and influence and are the the sort of seedbed for a lot of these ideologies because mm -hmm. when it when you really comes down to it you know this there's a there's a there's a phrase that i sort of um was playing around with recently with an with another friend another streamer uh um, and i was saying it's like worldview warfare and it's like they'll they'll want to it, they want to indoctrinate people with a certain worldview and it, and it tends to be a sort of materialistic or me mechanistic mm -hmm. atheistic kind of um view scientific view of the world with no soul no spirit accounted for um and things are just inevitably rolling out the way they are and there's nothing you can do about it like we mentioned at the start of the stream right and, and yeah. fabian freeway really goes into how they've managed to do that and indoctrinate so many people with this worldview uh and uh, and and they're still going you know the fabian society in the uk uh kier two tier kier was speaking to them fairly recently um i think 30 three of them or 35 of them are in fabians that is are in this new uh labor government so we've just elected 33 or 35 of these fabian socialists Good into Lord. our government yeah and you know most people would say who are the fabians what are they and uh, they had no idea so that's a really good angle in to you know helping people understand that these people are not on your side they don't care about you they tell you they do 
uh, but they do not. They most certainly do not. Well, it's like every other politician. They're just going to tell you whatever that the, they think you want to hear so that the you think that they're your guy or gal or they, them, or whatever the hell they happen to be. You know, it's all, it's, politics is nothing but a huge mind fuck. And, and I'm basically convinced at this point in my life that it's always been that way. And that it was, it, politics was developed to be the control structure when the transition was made from the church as the authority to the state as the authority, right? Because politics happened back when the church was the authority, but it was called something different, right? It wasn't called politics. So when they made that transformation, they had to transform the control structure as well. And that's, again, similar to what we see happening now as they're trying to consolidate all of the previous control structures into one overarching governance structure. So it's, you know, history always informs us of uh, where we're heading. And, and I think never more so than the times that we find ourselves in right now, right? So um, as, as I guess our segue out, because uh, you've been very generous with, uh, with your time this evening, Nick. Uh, we're already well over an hour at this point. Um, given the developments in the United Kingdom over the course of the last week and uh, how it seems that uh, just even normal speech is becoming ever more endangered, uh, how have... What steps have you taken to insulate yourself, your family, your channel, and, and you know, essentially all that you hold dear in the world uh, from what we see coming down the road? Like, what, what steps have you taken so far? Because folks are always looking for solutions. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm focusing mainly on building up page reviews into, into, to get it to, to get it to more people, to get it to the right people so that I can sort of do it for a living and, and really, um, help people come to an understanding of what's going on in the world. And, um, I'm trying to stay away from current events. I don't really comment much on things as they're happening. Um, I try to keep, for example, my, I have a telegram chat group and I try and keep that focused on books and quotes and the topics that we're discussing in the live streams. Because I think um, we're the tra the tra there's traps being set everywhere, and so the best thing we can do is to learn what are the traps, how do they operate, uh, how can we sidestep them and and point them out for each other as we go along. So things like re like reviewing history, because the because these are similar traps that have been laid before. This kind of insanity, this sort of um, warping of the, of of uh, objective reality, making everything subjective. So it's all about how a person interprets via way of their feelings what your intentions were and that gets you in prison this is the kind of world we're into now so you've got to be aware of how that sort of stuff works and be very um clued up on the historical precedents that we know about and that have been written about so you know like your solzhenitsyn his accounts of the gulag and gulag archipelago and all the craziness that went on there but also somebody like uh james Lindsay, he's got the new discourses um i think it's called the new discourses podcast you know he's done he's done pretty good episodes on navigating like struggle sessions the modern struggle sessions because that's what we're going through now and people in working in big corporate corporations will know this uh, i have a colleague of mine who's been pulled up in front of hr because she commented on somebody uh, who was eight months pregnant and she made a comment and this woman took offense and said i was being singled out because i'm pregnant and, uh, and it made me really uncomfortable blah, 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 and now she's been dragged up in front of HR. So you can't even mention, you know, the, <laughs> the eight months pregnant lady and the, you know, so this is the kind of world we're in now we're, we're sort of, we've got to be extremely hyper careful about who, what we say and to whom we say it. So another thing is, is taking steps. To, like I mentioned, uh, the start of the stream, there's certain things I don't talk about with certain people now. 
because it's become clear. You got to get good at recognizing who's going to be responsive to to have their mind opened and their eyes opened to new information and who isn't. And if once you once you work out they're not, stick to the weather, football, you know, whatever like topic you can that is safe. And so you got to identify those people. Um that's that's another thing and and finding finding the the people online but then try and transform that into real you know real world as well so if you can build up your community online find your people online but then also make some contacts in real life and shake some hands and uh, and get that that's good energy you know i remember during lockdowns going to some of these uh you know stand up and we had stand in the park where everyone would gather in certain parks on saturdays uh, and we would just stand there and, and sort of get to know each other and it would just it, you just because they they institu- instituted the six six meters apart rule or whatever it was six feet apart and people you know you weren't in each other's kind of space and in each other's right. energetic space right right so to which get was back, the whole point right and so so get so you want to find that and get that from the, the right kind of people and you know and i've been thinking more about interacting with other people in terms of uh frequency now so I tend not to think about like good, bad, like intelligent, stupid, you know, I try and think like, okay, I'm, I'm putting out a certain frequency and I'm going to meet other people and their frequency is either going to make harmony with my frequency or it's going to clash and make dissonance. Uh, And so it's just about finding those people who you make harmony with and, and, and building out those relationships and focusing on them and the people you make dissonance with be polite, be friendly, be uh you know keep it keep it talk shop you know talk business you know get in get out (laughs) but uh i think i think knowing the right people and being ultra careful about what we say and who we say it to moving forward is is probably my best piece of advice at this point unfortunately yeah well i think i think you're uh again spot on uh with that analysis because it is uh i think i think we've finally gotten to the time now you know before they were um they were serious about the censorship because you were you were going to be kicked off of the platform and and lose all of your privileges and and all of that and the fun was going to be taken away from you uh now we're moving into the phase where uh your words can hurt you not not that they're hurting other people necessarily although that's what they're going to uh try to get you to believe but they are they are now going to be capable of hurting you your your own words can now become violence against your own person and i think that's something that people need to keep in mind going forward especially those of us like myself uh who have a problem uh, a problem of shooting our mouths off before we think about what's about to come out of it you know and and are constantly playing damage control afterwards so uh, <laughs> Yeah. I have thought about that maybe uh, and because the other scary thing is that when we create uh, broadcasts and content and videos and we put it out there and it's out there and one of the things you know that they did in um in the the uh gulag archipelago is oh you said something 15 years ago to someone and now we're pulling you in to grill you about it and get you sent off to the work camp so i don't know if it's even worth having a sort of putting up um what do you call them disclaimers <laughs> right you know what i mean saying this is for entertainment and i'm running my mouth and nothing should be believed uh, you know and even though you might be making good points and serious analysis and talking about important things i wonder if there's a i don't know but if they want to come for you they'll probably just come for you no matter what <laughs> yeah yeah if they want to put you in the camp they're just going to come get you that's all there is to it yeah um, but yeah, it should be, uh, should be an interesting time to see how all this unfolds. And, uh, I, for one, I'm, I'm here for it. Honestly, if I, if I had my choice, I don't know that I would pick to live in any other point in history than, uh, right now. Uh, cause the, the cool thing about right now is we don't know how it's going to end yet. And the good part about that is neither does the parasite class. They think they know, and they think they have accounted for every possible variable that matters. Um, But history has shown time and again, 
you know, especially when we look back on some of the published works of past generations, history has shown time and again that there is always something that they miss in their meticulous planning. And that has always been what gives me hope for the future. So remember, folks, the, uh, the future is still unwritten, regardless of what other people want to tell you. Uh, history is a different story. Nick, it yeah. has been fantastic uh, having you on the show, getting to catch up with you a little bit, find out what you've been up to, and uh, also getting to share some of your knowledge and wisdom with the Liberty Radio audience as well. Uh, once again, let folks know where they can connect with you and your work. Sure thing. Uh, thank you very much. I've enjoyed this conversation very much. So uh, it's been great. I appreciate you having me on. So you can go to, uh, I'm on, let me think, let me see, let me guess right. YouTube, Odyssey and Rumble stream. Well, that's where I live stream. Uh, I also have Instagram, Twitter, and Telegram accounts where I sort of uh, post um, books. And I'll, I'll, if I get a new book in, I'll take pictures and upload that for those for people. So it's a good place if, if you're wondering what books to get hold of and what to buy. My Instagram account has loads of posts on there. You could scroll through there and that'll give you a good insight into what I've got in my library. Uh, Telegram is where I just announce my live streams and, and some of the things that I might be thinking about or maybe uh, work, my friends work. If I think, you know, if I have important videos I want to share, I'll put that on Telegram. Um, and then, but if you want to find it all in one place, it's allmylinks.com slash Haze Reviews. And that has, uh, you know, just a whole lot on the page. So you can pick and choose what you want to uh, check out from there. But uh, I would very much like to see, uh, invite anyone to come and join the live streams. We always have a good time. Uh, it's pretty relaxed. Uh, as I was saying earlier, we try and uh, give a, a cozy feeling of of curiosity and exploration and learning. So it's it's a it's a it's a break from the intensity of a, a lot of other social media and uh, and you know video production. Uh, there's a lot of doom pushes out there. There's a lot of fear mongering because that sells and people like to be scared. We go to watch horror films, don't we? And we ride roller coasters and you know that the chemicals that get released inside us when we're scared can become addictive. That's not what I'm trying to provide. I'm trying to provide some calm, relaxing, uplifting, uh, opportunities for learning and knowledge. And so if that sounds like your bag, please come and uh, check me out wherever uh, you feel most comfortable. But I would recommend Odyssey. I would recommend Odyssey as well. Uh, and again, that's only because they are the bestest and most awesome media platform going today. And feel free to clip that and use that in all of your promos, Odyssey. Uh, Nick, Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on Liberty Radio today. My pleasure.